Hello, welcome to The Rest is History. We continue with our World Cup marathon, and today we are in the Far East. We are in South Korea, the land of K-pop and the Squid Game. Uh, but also, Dominic... Um, yes, Tom. Well, I'm leaving it hanging because I was hoping that you'd come in because <laughs> because your, your choice of theme today is... Um, well, it's kind of it's it's a slightly recherche one, isn't it? But also an intriguing one. I wouldn't say recherche, Tom. I think it's fair to say since we started this podcast, the rest is history. There have been some subjects that you've been very keen to do. So you've often said you'd like to do, you know, the Roman emperors. Um, one day you will give us your podcast about the historical Jesus. Uh, well, for Christmas, it's going to be a Christmas treat. Voted for by the fans, which everyone's much looking forward to. And another subject that I know you've often shown an enormous amount of interest in. You've said you're particularly passionate, I believe, about early modern South Korean poetry. Is that right, Tom? Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, you know, I mean, right from the beginning, I was saying we have to do an episode on that because yeah, that is what the punters will want. <laughs> it's, it's a subject that we've often had a lot of requests about. People have said, when are you going to do yeah, it's, the... It's Hitler, Tudors, 16th century South Korean poetry. It's just endless. But today is the day. Sorry, it may seem a cliche to you, Tom, but we're going to be talking about the South Korean poet Hwang ji Ni. They do let's, that on all the other podcasts. Let's cut to it. Has Dan Snow done it? Yes, he does it every other week. <laughs> um, so let's cut to the chase. How familiar are you with the institution of the um, Kaesyeng? The, the Korean geisha girls. It is. Very good. Very good, Tom. Yeah. Kisyang were, they were women from outcast families or kind of slave families. And basically they were trained to be courtesans and they provided entertainment and sort of comfort, I suppose you would say, if you were being euphemistic to powerful men. But is it, is it, so how, I mean, how like the geishas are they kind of modeled on them? Um, no, or is it the other I way around, say, or I is it from say, a common cultural matrix? I'm probably not as familiar with Japanese history, to be completely frank with you, as I could be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they are not influenced. They're not sort of modelled on them at all. So I'll explain where they sort of come from. So Korea. Let's do a bit about the history of Korea generally. The idea of Korea and the Korean state comes from a kingdom called the Kingdom of Goryeo, which was... Um, it sort of flourished from about the 10th century to the 14th century. And I think it's fair to say at the outset two things. One, neither of us is really an expert on Korean history. Is that fair to say, Tom? I think that is fair. And secondly, although we both obviously do speak Korean. <laughs> um, but not, not medieval, is it? Medieval Korean is not really our specialism. No. So it was in, this, in the period from the 10th century to the 14th century, sort of three regions basically become merged into a single entity which is the, the basis of um, modern-day Korea. And at this point, Korea was Buddhist. So this kingdom, the kingdom of um, Goryeo, is the sort of golden age of Buddhism in Korea. And there's all kinds of sort of trade and industry with other sort of Buddhist places and all this kind of stuff. And then that falls in the end of the 14th century, and it's replaced by another sort of great sort of um, kingdom, which is called the kingdom of Choseon. The big difference is religious. It will please you to hear. The new one isn't Buddhist. It's Confucian. Confucianism gives way. So Confucianism replaces Buddhism. So in both cases, influenced by, you know, this is reflecting what's happening in China. Yeah, absolutely. So China is the big, the big influence. So that um, great Joseon kingdom, which runs from 1392 to 1897, this is the sort of golden age of Korean identity, of Korea sort of maturity. Most of the things in modern Korea, so culture, language, literature, all these things are, are traced back from this period. And one really important element of it is the institution of the Kiseng. And so these are the sort of, as you said, the, the, the courtesans. There were a few thousand of them, not a huge number, and um, they were spread throughout the country. So mostly in cities, but also in sort of smaller towns and villages. They're first mentioned in about the 11th century. Um, and they're sort of entertainers. They work, they do needlework, they play music, all of these kinds of things, apart from their, you know, as well as their kind of sexual services. They are very, very highly educated. So they're a bit like um, Hatira in ancient Greece, perhaps. Exactly. So that's a nice comparison. Yes. They're sort of an odd social status because on the one hand, they are the lowest group in society. So they're what's called chonmin, which means they're kind of slaves, kind of like churls or something. 
And that's a, that's a hereditary status. So if you're at that level of that bottom stratum, your children will inherit it as well. So it's a kind of caste system. It's caste, exactly. So they're considered unclean. And other people who are in that chomin stratum are butchers and entertainers and shamans and Toilet sorcerers. And, exactly, exactly. Um, eventually, the uh, Kisieng are owned by, they're, they're considered slaves owned by the government. They are, they're better treated than normal slaves because they're considered very highly educated, very, very highly trained. And so this is, this is a kind of hereditary thing that you're, you're a girl born to one of these women. And then are you then some are. Raised, are you then kind of raised to be very educated and well some are absolutely yes some definitely are the daughters of other Kisieng, but some of them are people from poor families who can't afford to maintain their girls so get sold into slavery exactly now today we I suppose we would say wouldn't we and some of the listeners people listen to this podcast they would say these these are sex slaves this is a terrible business and of course through our twenty first century eyes it is but on the other hand. I think people in sort of medieval Korea might well have thought of this quite differently. The weird thing is, although they're the lowest possible status, they also do have a kind of prestige because they are so highly educated and they are seen as artists and writers. So they produce music and they produce poetry. And presumably their services are bought by people of who power and status can set them up and provide them with comfort and security exactly they are they're trained eventually they're trained by the government so this is kind of state run yeah. female education so basically you enter the you enter the workforce as it were when you're about 16 or 17 and your career is over actually pretty quickly so your career can be over within 5 or 10 years i don't know whether that's because you become pregnant and had started to have children uh, but it might be because you become the concubine of a sort of powerful patron who buys you out of the service. Or well, maybe it's like Hollywood, you know, because that's a stereotype, isn't it? Your showgirl, yeah, district attorney, driving Miss Daisy, isn't it? It's the the three ages of Hollywood actors. <laughs> Is that right? Showgirls. What was the third one? Was driving Miss Daisy and the middle one? District attorney. District attorney for women in in Hollywood. Right. So if you're a female actor in Hollywood. You know, you have your, your your time in the sun, sex symbol, and then suddenly the calls dry up. Yeah. Gina Gina Davis has a autobiography out at the moment, which apparently is brilliantly funny and very good on all this. Okay. So maybe it's that. Maybe you just have, you know, you have, as one of these entertainers, you have your time in the sun and then it's all over. And presumably if that is the case, then you need to bank your youth and looks. You do. Uh, it's very important you do that or else you end, you you end up on the scrap heap or what happens. <laughs> Most of the former Kisiang actually go to work in taverns. They become basically landladies. Okay. So so that's the sort of trajectory. So a bit like sportsmen owning pubs back <laughs> in the exactly. 70s. For Leeds United footballers from <laughs> yeah. 1973. Exactly. So basically you have this Kisiang house where you all kind of it's, – it's, it's much too simplistic to call it a brothel, I suppose. It's a sort of – because it's a much it's – it's a house of entertainment and the arts – and they're inspected twice a month. Officials sort of inspect them. I don't know how intimate these inspections are. They have to do kind of continued professional training in sort of dance and music and stuff. A lot of them will have a patron who's called a gibu, and he might be an official or a soldier or or a sort of um, you know a sort of a local bigwig or something like that. So you would try to have one of these things, and hopefully in the long run you could just become his his concubine. Um, but sometimes there's a bit of conflict. And, and do, do any of them ever marry? That never happens. No, I don't think really, because I think you're so low status. Right. And I think once you enter this world, that's not really that's a career open to you. But this world is, I mean, it's better than being poor and being a beggar or, you know, something like that. This is, this is a, a, a quite, it's very hard to sort of pin down. And, but I think because our mentality is just not attuned to that, to, to that, to this world. Yeah, the, the nature of the status because it, it's simultaneously very low status, but also quite prestigious in a, in a weird way. If that makes sense, I, I suppose as you said, like a like a Greek hetara. Yeah, I mean that's the same, right? Pretty much, yeah. So one thing that um, the Kisieng were very very known for is poetry. They are trained to write poetry, um, and they write these verses called sijo which are kind of the equivalent of haikus. So they're very short, kind of three lines or something. And they're often me very melancholy. 
they're about kind of bereavement well, I imagine, or heartache. I, I, or, I imagine your life must be pretty melancholy. Yeah, I'm sure it's not a bundle of laughs. Not a bundle of laughs. But you might put some of the fi- some famous Kissing um, poems were written. They're almost like love poems to great scholars, and and their poems are a big part of Korean literature. So people will study them in school, and unlike a lot of other women in Korean society, so sort of late medieval, early modern period, I mean, Kissing move around. So they're moving between different social groups and between different kind of parts of the social landscape. And that means they are, they're figures in stories and they're kind of mobile. Mm. So it kind of gives them a centrality. Exactly. In, in, yes. in, in medieval culture. It does indeed. It does indeed. Because by, by and large, most medieval poets in Europe are men. Exactly. And that's what makes them so remarkable. And the most remarkable one of all is a woman called Huang Jini. So her Gixiang name was Myongwol, which means bright moon. But she is by far the most famous Gixiang of the Choseon dynasty. Should we take a break at this point? Yes, because we are going to focus. We're going to focus on this great character. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Really look forward to that. Um, We'll see you in a few minutes. Hello, welcome back. We are in Korea, the land of female medieval poets, uh, Dominic, which you were you were brilliantly explicating in the first half. I, th- I think brilliantly is pretty strong, Tom. But <laughs> no, uh... I, it was brilliant. And um, you have introduced the most famous one of the lot. Huang Jini, Tom. So yes, she, she lived from about 1500 to about 1560. She is a massive figure in Korean culture, as I'll go into to explain. So what's her kind of... What she not Shakespeare, but what? Maybe she's Byron, Tom. Okay, that would appeal to you. Yeah, it would. I mean, I love her already. I only said that to pander to you, to be honest with you. I love her. Uh, so, what do we know about her? We think she's the, the daughter of a scribe called John Hun Gyum. Oh, so like Diocletian. But John Hun Gyum is a woman. Yeah. So, and the story goes that she was her mother was washing underneath a bridge when a handsome man, a politician's son, called Huang Chin Sa came across her, and they fell in love instantly, as people often seem to have done in the medieval, early modern period, Mm -hmm. Tom, in literature. Extraordinary. Especially by bridges. By bridges. So presumably a kind of liminal space. (laughs) Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Podcasting's game was academia's loss, (laughs) I think it's fair to say. (laughs) Um, You could be decolonizing a curriculum right now, and instead you're wasting, you're throwing your life away on this. Listening to you titter. Exactly. (laughs) So he came back that night. They, they drank together, they spent the night together, and Huang Jini was the result. And obviously, because she's born out of wedlock... Does the father just gallop off? He yeah, he just disappears. He has nothing more to do with her. That's the end of him. We don't, we, he will not re- reappear in this story, Tom. She's very, very beautiful. Um, her mother brings her up. Um, her mother herself loved music and dance, so educates Huang Jini and all this sort of stuff. Why did she become a Gixiang? Well, here's why. Because there's a story that one day... A funeral procession was going past her house and she looked out and the coffin stopped outside her house uh, because she was reading her poetry and the coffin wouldn't budge. It was listening to her reading her poems. That's fabulous. What a wonderful, wonderful image. And it only moved when she ran out and she pulled off her skirt, her outer skirt, and threw it over the coffin. And only at that point did the coffin move again, which is very strange. Yeah. Currents. Later on, Tom, it turned out that the coffin was the body of an aristocratic man who had fallen in love with her, but couldn't marry her because of her low status, and had died of a broken heart. She's 15 years old, and the story goes that at that point, she, um, she realized her tremendous appeal, and she decided forthwith to become a, a Kisieng. So that's the story. Right. The more prosaic explanation <laughs> yeah. is, is, that, is that her mother couldn't afford to keep her and sent her away. And she yeah. therefore became a courtesan. Yeah. So you okay. can choose, you know, are you a romantic? Well, I'm, going for, I'm going for the former. Yeah, obviously. We're romantics on the rest of history, so we believe the, the former story. She starts out as a courtesan. She's, she's very sort of successful. There's a story told about her when she's quite young 
one of her first trips, she gets basically her own gibu, her own patron, or sort of a strange sort of patron. And this client. one is a, this one is alive, presumably. Yes, yes, he's alive. So that's good. He's a man called Yi Xiang, and they go off to the Diamond Mountains. Oh, wonderful! But they run out of money, and so they they beg. Oh, and yes. So, so he's a he's a dud as a patron then. He's not, well, he's a terrible dud, Tom, because at one point. They're, they're, they're in such dire straits that she has to sell her favours to a monk. So what does this story tell us? I mean, I, I, I read academic explanations of what this story told us. I mean, I think this story tells you nothing good. But but apparently this story tells us that um, she can deal with men as an equal, that she uh, can use her sexuality to get what she wants, and that she's very frank and kind of authentic, and she doesn't care what she does. I mean, that's one way of interpreting it, I suppose. And it's sort of said, this sort of thing about her frankness is a big part of her appeal. So it's said that she doesn't wear any jewellery, which most Kisiang did. She doesn't wear any makeup or fancy clothes because she's so naturally beautiful. Yeah. But also because she's pioneering a new kind of style, which is unadorned, authentic, yeah. all this sort of thing. And is her poetry like that? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the poetry because I'm about to get onto the poetry. Uh, because... She's famous because of this interaction with the monk. Let's not delve too deeply into that. Um, <laughs> but she's also famous because of her verses, which have survived. So I said beforehand that they, there's a kind of um, formula called a sijo, which is it's older than a haiku. It's quite similar. They normally have three lines. Obviously, when they're translated, it doesn't quite follow the same format. I'll probably read it in English rather than Korean. So this is a, a very probably her most famous poem, Tom. I will divide this long November light and coil by coil lay it under a warm spring blanket and roll by roll when my frozen love returns, I will unfold it to the night. That's wonderful. You like that? Yeah. That's translated by David Bannon uh, in the Hangul Herald. I love it. The, apparently the double meaning that you don't get in English is that uh, the word that she uses for her beloved, her frozen love, which is David Bannon's translation, um, it means somebody, there's some kind of wordplay. It means both your sweetheart and somebody who has been frozen by winter. Great. Another famous poem is called Full Moon. And this is a, some sort of play on her, on her Yixiang name, which also means bright mood. Yeah. There was a very famous sort of scholar called Byok Kie Su, who was famous for his virtue. And his sort of uh, yeah. asceticism, yeah. chastity. Yeah. So you can imagine what uh, Yang Jini set out to seduce him, and indeed did seduce him. This is the this is the poem that she wrote to him. Do not boast of your speed, O blue green stream running by the hills. Once you've reached the wide ocean, you can return no more. Why not stay here and rest when moonlight stuffs the empty hills? <laughs> stuffs. No, that's what I thought, Tom. That uh, stuffs was an unusual choice. <laughs> can a hill be stuffed with moonlight? I mean, maybe it can. It's got a cave. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, that's that's an image we shouldn't really pursue. So the thing that she's most famous for, Tom, is her riddle. And I should have flagged this up at the beginning because I think people would have looked forward to me asking you this riddle. It's like Bilbo and Gollum. Basically, the thing was, you could come to see her and only if you passed the test of the riddle would you be able to spend the night oh, with her no. or whatever. Now, the riddle was known... Is the Geomiligo Idabulchul. And um, I, I don't know what to say to you, Tom, but, but, but that is the riddle. That's the riddle. Yeah. I just have a policy of not, of not answering riddles. I just don't really approve of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dominic, I mean, not to be, not to be offensive. Yeah. Y you were not as personable as Huang Jini. No. And so I don't want to spend the night with you. Okay, fair enough. So I'm not going to answer it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you the answer because I don't think you do know the answer. Uh, the answer is in the title. Geomiligu Idabuljul. Um, I'm reading this from what I've read. Yes, understood, understood. If you combine the variations in the title of the characters, if you fiddle with it in some way, the first part, Geomiligu, creates the Chinese character that means spoken word, and the second part <laughs> means day. Right. And then those words together, you get the Chinese word that means consent. Right. And, and then you're in. Wow. So I think you had to be there, really. Yeah, I think probably. it's um, <laughs> probably. Anyway, uh, only, one person, many, only one person. Only one person. One. One. So you're only actually one. in good company. Yeah, you're in good company. So, so she was a courtesan, but she only ever had one 
She only ever slept with one person. Well, this, <laughs> this is what was the monk. Um, so the, monk, <laughs> the monk got it. But presumably the guy... No, the, the, monk useless- pre- the monk is pre-riddle. Oh, okay. And, and, and the useless patron. Yeah. And what happens to him? Just, just got the boot at some point. Did he? So did she, did she end up with a, with a rich and powerful patron who set her up for life? Or what happened to her? She hung around with a scholar. He's the guy who actually solved the riddle. Um, okay, he was a guy yeah. called uh, Shio Kyung Dok. She said that he was one of the three wonders of the Kaesong area. That's what she said. The other wonders were herself. <laughs> I love how she sounds great. And the Pakyon Falls. Okay. But, uh, oh, I forgot to say about, about the monk. He had been celibate for 30 years. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so, and then she yeah. stole his heart. So, tremendous figure. But what happened to him after he'd... The monk or the scholar? Yeah, the monk. No. I mean, you're asking for details that I just don't know. Okay. That nobody knows. That's the, okay. nat- the nature of history. Yeah, okay. Because there's an awful lot of uncertainty. But I imagine that she's such a famous person that actually these people, people would have constructed narratives about them. We shall come to the constructed narratives. She died perhaps when she was 60, perhaps not. You know, it's very unclear. And she was buried in a simple grave on a riverbank in Kaesong. She'd written these nice poems and there were all these folk tales about her seducing monks. And so everybody was delighted with that. So there are two TV series and two different films all about her produced in recent years. They all have the same title. They're all called Huang Jini. However, she's not thought of highly. So she was from what's now North Korea and all this carry on, interfering with monks, <laughs> riddles, mm. writing poems. All this happened in what's now North Korea. Right. The North Koreans are not keen on this at all. Why? They don't celebrate it. They don't. Because they're very puritanical. They don't approve of prostitution. They also don't approve of the descendants of Qixiang. So the biggest Qixiang school of all was located in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Right. And it's full of people who are descendants of Qixiang. Um, but the North Korean communist regime regard them as having tainted blood because of their, their role. But they were workers. Well, I don't think it sees it that. Again, this goes back to their ambiguous social yeah, okay. status. Um, so they are not celebrated and they are sort of told to feel that they're full of shame and stuff even though she is arguably the most famous the most famous north korean not that it was north korea apart from kim Jong-un. various bad guys uh she's not celebrated there as much as she as much as she should be but she's celebrated in south korea she is hugely well i told you two tv yeah. series two films which you should you know we you should report back in a future edition of the rest is history well, I, I love the squid game right so who knows who knows and, indeed. I, I, and I love a, a, a glamorous medieval yeah. Poet. Well, there's not perhaps as much about her. She's one of those people in history who, when you sort of dig into it, there's probably not as much reliable evidence. That's as one fine. Would hope. Well, Dominic, you know, I'm not gonna, it's not going to bother me. No. Well, you were very skeptical. She's about a kind Alexander of poetic, p- poetic Emma Hamilton. Yes. Perhaps, okay. Fair that enough. That kind of thing. So that's, that's uh, Huang Jini. I mean, that's an excursion, a historical excursion that, frankly, I never expected to make. No. Um, but I'm glad that <laughs> but, I did. Well, Dominic, what I'd say is that. Um, this has been the great joy of doing the, these World Cup episodes. It's the way that things you assume kind of fairly immutable social forms, gender relations, all that kind of stuff, how looked at through the prism of a different culture and a different age, they can look so... It shows you the infinitude of, yeah. of what human culture can be. I will end with a lovely poetry reading because I know yes, please do. people enjoy these. This is another Huang Jini special called Thoughts of Man Will Die. Translated by Aene Jung. An old temple sits forlornly by a brook from the palace. The evening sun bids a sad farewell to the trees. This tranquil season dissipates into only monks' dreams, leaving time layered in ice atop a broken pagoda. The phoenix has departed, the everyday sparrow in its stead. Cattle and sheep pull at the grass of ruins overflowing with azaleas. As I remember Songak Mountain's flourishing and flowering youth, I realise how much spring could instead resemble autumn. Goodbye. Bye-bye.